Hi again, Gary Peluso Verden. This is session three for our Regenerating the Spirit of Democracy course. And I've called this one the Spiritualities of Capitalism, Christian Right, Democracy or Republican, uh, Democracy or Democratic Republic. Um, and it could, could have called it a number of things, but uh, including something like uh, compare and contrast these three, because we're going to do a little bit of that today. Uh, but let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, for the devotion today, um, I'm taking a, a passage from what I just think is a beautiful book by Robin Wall Kimmerer uh, called Braiding Sweetgrass. And she is a, a member of the Potawatomi Nation uh, and a PhD botanist. And if you can imagine a book that is a combination of Botany, poetry, and Native American spirituality, you can imagine something in this book. Beautiful, beautiful writing. Well, here's a quote from her that I thought very much is related to the class. After all these generations since Columbus, some of the wisest of Native elders still puzzle over the people who came to our shores. They look at the toll on the land and say, the problem with these new people is they don't have both feet on the shore. One is still on the boat. They don't seem to know whether they're staying or not. This same observation is heard from some contemporary scholars who see in the social pathologies and relentless materialistic culture the fruit of homelessness, a rootless past. America has been called the home of second chances. For the sake of the peoples and the land, the urgent work of the second man, the second coming of, of white people if, if, to the shores, if, if, as you will, may be to set aside the ways of the colonist and become indigenous to place. But can Americans, as a nation of immigrants, learn to live as if we are staying with both feet on the shore? She presents a beautiful way of seeing, but mostly a way of being. Vine Deloria and other indigenous writers underline a fundamental difference between Western European orientation toward time and Native American orientation towards place. Living in a place as part of that place, as if you and your successors will be there forever. Your ancestors were there, your, your, your Grandchildren and grandchildren seven times removed will be there. Rather than living somewhere temporarily, extracting all you can and moving on, or as she says in the book, basically, you know, most animals know you don't poop where you eat, which is what some Native peoples and not a few of the rest of us think we've done with the land here. A spirituality for democracy, she asserts, would in some fashion involve us thinking about future generations, but also being a part of an ecology of all living beings and the planet that somehow the future, all life today and the planet actually get a vote. It's a profound concept. Big idea for today. Again, Pinky Dinky Doo helping out, which by the way, um, you know, Hold this up a second. So I'm also helped today by Professor Joe Cool and his assistant Woodstock. Um, my family thought I needed a, a, a pro proper professorial tie and I, I'm a great peanuts lover. So let's go to Pinky Dinky Doo helping us think about the big idea. This today, uh, probably more than any other session, is really an exercise in imagination. What is the spirituality we need in this nation in order to grow uh, and become what we want. Um, it's in our imagination we form uh, connections between the bits of data and we construct stories out of those. Um, in my presentations, you're getting a peek into my imagination, how I put these bits together. And this presentation is an invitation for you to consider the same bits, um, but how do you put them together? This is Max Weber, uh, the famous German sociologist who wrote a book that became a classic, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. He was one of the first, uh, I think, to try to think about uh, uh, capitalism as itself having a spirit. 
And how does that spirit, where does that spirit come from? He, he has this wonderful term that he uses that I'm going to be using today and has been instructor for my work ever since I learned it some decades ago, elective affinities. Uh, elective affinities means correlations. Uh, somehow that pieces are maybe connected to each other, then it's, it's connections that we intuit rather than necessarily being able to prove a chain of cause and effect. If you see, for instance, the belief in the priority of individuals over communities, and you see that belief worked out in society's religion, in economics, uh, and in politics, without knowing what the cause and effect chain might be, one might claim, well, there is an interesting affinity. Uh, let's explore it. So Weber said there were affinities between Puritanism, uh, uh, the Protestant work ethic being developed as, a, uh, as one of the uh, evidences that one was living uh, as one who is saved properly should, uh, and then the emphasis upon thrift and modesty and savings, which were all that work ethic, thrift, modesty, and savings was all correlated with capitalism at that time because when Weber was writing around the turn of the 19th and the 20th century, capitalism meant to extract raw, raw materials, employ labor, make a product, make a profit, save it, save your profit, and invest as much as possible to grow. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the spirit of capitalism would be thought of exactly today since capitalism is quite different, finance capitalism, uh, with the emphasis upon uh, risk-taking and personal and corporate debt, uh, and uh, with a strong consumer economy where uh, spending rather than saving uh, is what is encouraged. Um, you like my popsicle trees? Uh, that's the best I could do with the little drawing tool in uh, PowerPoint. Um, there are three strands of U.S. spirituality I'm going to look at today. There are not only three strands that comprise the American brand of spirituality. There are a whole lot more than three. Um, there are numerous strands, not the least of which are variations upon capitalism, Christianity, and democratic republicanism. Um, if I had picked, for instance, social business capitalism, the, the doing well by doing good, um, Catholic Christianity, as, uh, as it is rooted in papal teachings on social justice, and a former democracy that had more democracy and less republic, um, the thoughts I would have put together would be very different. So I picked, though, three prominent strands that, uh, uh, of the braid, as I think it's most powerfully evidenced today. Um, and I'm going to read through these sections where I compare uh, going back to my first presentation with those four categories of culture that's co-inhabited by politics and religion. I'm expanding that to include now uh, a version of capitalism in that so that you have these three spirits side by side, looking at them from the viewpoint of stories, belonging, moral order, and empowerment. So in this and the following slides, I'm bringing back those cultural categories and adding to it capitalism. I'm going to read through these slides um, uh, and uh, because it's, they're dense uh, and I'm going to give you a, a, some time to try to uh, absorb and, and reflect and react. Um, uh, so I'm going to read through them with a little amplification along the way. Capitalism. Uh, what is its story? Who are its heroes? What, uh, what kind of drama? Uh, is representing that story. You know, every story is a drama of some sort uh, where there's some tension and conflict uh, that uh, the protagonists are trying to overcome. Capitalism. Uh, I don't know how many times I've heard it's the greatest wealth generator in human history. Um, being able to come here and make a good living um, <clears throat> and not based on who you were in some other place uh, is fundamental to the American dream. Um, one has freedom here, freedom to go as far as your work and your grit enable. So again, the story goes. The heroes might be thought of as the risk-taking entrepreneurs, the pioneer innovators. Um, often people, uh, men, uh, often with huge egos, um, um, not according to you know, Jim Collins' uh, Good to Great some, uh, some years back now, 
uh, where he said, no, it's really the people who are the humble servants who are the real heroes, but they're not the ones so much the heroes in popular culture, right? Um, uh, those who <clears throat> can meet human needs and create human needs, and I put needs in, in, quote, in quotes there because uh, what's a need? What's the difference between a need and a want? Um, can needs, uh, can, are there needs that can be diminished or expanded? Of course, and that's all part of our market economy. The chief drama uh, is to, uh, it's a transformational drama, um, uh, taking labor ideas and raw materials and then transforming them into marketable products and services um, by, by making a profit uh, you know, making a profit involves you know, meeting a need, creating a need and filling it, um, making something better. Uh, and and, and that's, that's some of the story uh, as it's told. Now, let's look, move over to Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism, kind of basic story is, Jesus is Lord of all persons and all nations. The U.S. is particularly blessed by God with resources and responsibilities for the conversion of the whole world. Um, and, and that's the way they see it, Constitution is valid only to the extent that that it allows that uh, Christians are allowed to evangelize in an unhindered way. Um, uh, conversion of the whole world, or at least protect us against everything and everyone associated with Satan, because the drama between God and Satan is real in the human soul and between nations. But it is up to every individual. This is a very individualistic understanding of faith. Uh, up to every individual to make a decision for or against God. Um, heroes tend to be warrior figures. Um, those who, in this, the drama, fight God's war against the forces of evil and enlist to convert others to engage in that fight. Um, while the war is waged, um, while the war is being waged, humankind is to be fruitful and multiply to dominate nature. Here, the, the, the dominate nature, have dominion is, is, is interpreted by some as a form of dominate. We're the top of the food chain. We're the hyper keystone species on the planet. Uh, in a democratic republic, stories, heroes, drama, uh, the people are engaged in that great experiment of self-governance to gain and defend their freedom. That's pretty fundamental to the way I understand democracy, especially in the United States. Voting can result in either a majority rule or minority rule. It depends on, on how all the voting apparatus is set up, and that's one of the dramas, in fact, we're facing right now. A hero could be one who plays hardball politics and gets things done, or the great negotiator who gains traction and gets things done through compromise, depending on what era one is living in. Uh, the chief drama is this open-ended play about the human capacity for self-rule, for individual responsibility and freedom played out between the one and the many, between the individual and the collective. Um, democracies uh, can feel either uh, very fragile or very stable. It's all part of the drama. Are we in a fragile period? Are we in a stable period? Fragile period, democracy might become what? Well, historically, it was uh, by the philosophers and political scientists concerned that it could, be, could degrade into uh, either um, a fascist uh, state or uh, some sort of uh, uh, authoritarian type state. Um, uh, a, a tyranny, a slipping back into tyranny, or the majority exercising the tyranny over the minority. All right? So, all right. You might see there some emphasis upon the individual and upon the transformation and domination of, of nature that comes through, as well as freedom. How does freedom play out in those three? There might be some affinities. Uh, uh, between those concepts and values there. All right, so going on to criteria and rules for belonging. In capitalism, those who create the markets and have something to exchange in the markets are those who belong. Uh, one of the uh, uh, conversations I've had that have stuck with me for a few decades now happened uh, in a cab as I was driving with our, our host uh, doing an, uh, an accreditation visit 
in a two-thirds world country um, just off the U.S. coast. And, uh, and he said, as he, we went through n numerous little villages on the way to our destination, he said, he said, if people don't have something to buy or sell in the global economy, they feel like they are invisible and they don't count. That has stuck with me. Now, those who create the markets and with something to exchange in the markets belong. Those with money, labor, raw materials, innovations, ideas. Um, if you can't work, where do you belong? Um, going to the Christian nationalism, Christians of a particular kind, these are the ones who belong, judged by their doctrinal beliefs and embrace of a particular social agenda, they belong. Um, Christians should be uh, the elected representatives of the people. True Christians also make the truest citizens. Uh, and we must always beware of heretics and apostates. Heretics are those who take part of the truth and make it the whole truth and try to then uh, uh, wipe out the rest of the truth. Apostates are those who actually leave the faith uh, and, and unclaim it. So apostates for, uh, in, in Christian nationalism would definitely be secularists, atheists, liberals, by the way, and socialists, communists, anybody who's not associated with capitalism. Uh, Christians should be, uh, uh, should be elected representatives, like I said, okay, to where the heretics and apostates. For the Democratic Republic, um, uh, defined by citizenship, who is a citizen? What does that mean to be a citizen? Who cannot be a citizen? Whose citizenship may be revoked? thinking in terms of even the temporary revocation of citizenship that felons in, in, in so many places uh, experience. Uh, the status of, of non-citizens, what is it? Uh, do they have any belonging uh, or are they uh, completely excluded from belonging uh, in any meaningful way? What about corporations, those corporate citizens or, or, the, or the, personal, you know, the person that's translated into corporation? What's the relationship between citizenship, representation, and money? Does money provide an individual or a corporation more belonging? Okay, so that sense of who belongs uh, and how we, what are the rules for determining who belongs? Is the belonging more or less expansive or more limited? Um, uh, and, and we have rules for... for uh, uh, who belongs and who doesn't, who makes for the truest citizens uh, and the like. Uh, what might be some of, the, some of the affinities between these types of belonging? Maybe especially, as we're going to see in the next slide here, maybe especially in terms of, of, uh, uh, of those who um, don't quite meet the, the, the criteria, uh, such as the non-Christians and and the immigrants. Moral order. Uh, basic understanding of what we owe to each other. Uh, what does it mean to do good in, 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 for, uh, uh, for whatever your cause is, uh, whether that be making money, whether that be evangelization, whether that be um, a, a free and fair republic. Um, so, capitalism, time is money, uh, obey the laws of supply and demand, uh, and the law that the market knows best. Um, shareholder value, uh, at least as it's as evolved in uh, the last few decades, is of, of primary importance. Uh, protecting the sanctity of private property rights, going back to the very founding of this republic, and any republic that, uh, that uh, one's property cannot be taken away without due cause. Uh, diversity is good if it means a multiplication of markets, so that diversity could be real positive. Corporations uh, amplify power and, and, and reduce individual responsibility. Uh, so therefore, the individual may not be exactly the kind of moral actor in a corporate environment as that individual needs to be a qua individual. Um, it is a competitive environment. Uh, conflict is expected. 
Uh, but on the other hand, cooperation between sometimes conflicting entities to defeat another enemy, another, outs another group competing for your business can be a good thing. Cooperation it's, uh, is not, uh, uh, can be a virtue. This is a survival of the fittest mentality or, or the survival of the most adaptable. Uh, if you cannot work, invest, or spend, what are you? What status do you have? Uh, what is owed to you? What do you possibly owe if you don't have anything to contribute? This is according to the moral order of capitalism, right? I mean, remember, I'm, I'm trying to imagine my way into each of these three categories. And what is the public role of corporations? Uh, if they don't have, if, if individuals don't have the same responsibility as corporate actors as they are as individual actors, but the corporation in some way is, uh, limits the individual's liability, but then what is the a public role of corporations, especially in a society in which they've been given voice, um, uh, Citizens United. Um, Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism, the moral order, is based on uh, completely on what's called, what they call, in fact, the biblical worldview, meaning that science, history, psychology, morality, national purpose, international relations, everything else you can imagine is derived from the Bible. Uh, the world is sinful and fallen. Um, the biblical worldview is that this, uh, uh, this understanding of, of what we owe to each other is a hierarchy um, uh, of male over female uh, and of Christian over non-Christian and the like. Uh, and it is a very tightly bounded worldview. Uh, by tightly bounded, we mean that that there's a constant attention to the fringes the, uh, of the group, that no impurities, no pollutants come in. Um, uh, they very often will talk in the language of holy versus abomination. Um, and in, again, in sociological terms, we might say that they, they invoke purity codes, uh, whether that be what marriage means, what sexuality means, or uh, what it means to have a... a uh, clear boundaries around the nation. Um, there's a strong belief in retributive justice, meaning that punishment is owed for those who do wrong. Um, and, uh, and when you think about tight boundaries, again, I sometimes think about the cultural difference between, let's say, New Orleans and San Francisco on the one hand, and Guymon and Guthrie on the other. Uh, New Orleans and San Francisco, we think, is more uh, places where things are a little wilder, uh, and certainly where things are, where society doesn't have as many restrictions on what you should do and shouldn't do um, uh, around drugs and sex and music and dress and all kinds of other things. A whole lot of live and let live, um, just, you know, uh, stay out of each other's path as much as possible. Very different from middle to small town life, right? Uh, where boundaries tend to be a little tighter, a little more suspicion of the stranger, the outsider. Um, as far as the democratic republic, moral order would include free and fair elections, high, toler high, high levels of conflict. Uh, you've got to expect conflict in a democracy. A tolerance of diversity. Um, protection of individual rights, uh, uh, life, liberty, and property in particular, uh, thinking of that. Uh, relationship, uh, uh, there should be some relationship in, in democratic republic between freedom and equality. Um, which, by the way, you didn't quite see where equality comes in when it comes to capitalism and Christian nationalism, right? Um, uh, you might have seen, in fact, inequalities uh, as, as built in to what a right-looking society looks like. Um, how is the spirit of democracy cultivated or diminished within a democratic republic? Um, can there be a democracy without a certain level of neighbor regard? And boundaries? Uh, 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 
one of the boundaries uh, we debate in our country is around immigration. Uh, and in a democratic republic, especially of our sort, throughout a lot of our history, uh, there has been a, uh, a point of view uh, amongst our elected leaders that immigration can be a good, but always to a point. And we tend to close off borders and tighten down on immigration when we fear that something is being lost. All right, so moral order, you can see again some similarities, I think, between the emphasis on the individual. You see how freedom plays in the rest of the, all of this. You see how diversity plays in rather differently uh, in these pieces. You see how boundaries play um, and how we regard the other really plays in. Um, an empowerment to be the people that we need to be uh, and overcoming what our obstacles are. Capitalism, you know, allow those markets to be free of artificial regulation. Let the market rule. Uh, reward risk takers. Uh, do not interfere with the death and life struggle, uh, life cycle of creative destruction. In other words, allow the natural order uh, to, uh, to have its way. Um, and in, in uh, today, given the, the uh, strength of finance capitalism versus let's make stuff, um, uh, how reliant are we, uh, is capitalism, on saving and investment or on uh, the ability to uh, accumulate that and spend? Very different understandings of empowerment. Uh, empowerment in one sense is I've got a lot of money because I was thrifty and saved it. And empowerment in another sense is I've got access to a, a lot of borrowing I can go into debt and my, uh, the, the, the banks to which I'm indebted or the houses to which I'm indebted uh, will uh, back me up. Um, very different sense of empowerment there, right? In Christian nationalism, accept Jesus Christ as you know, Lord and Savior, accept God's sovereignty out of all of life, um, uh, work to build the outward signs of being a Christian nation uh, Christianity is the official religion. Uh, the hierarchy moves from God the Father to men and then down. Um, uh, the empowerment comes from trying to spread Christianity of a particular sort into every realm and dominion, is the way some talk about it, uh, of life, to the schools, to uh, all laws based on biblical worldview, uh, to the, who's elected for leaders, who's appointed as judges, uh, who are the military leaders, what is shown and who controls the media, and who has their, their hands on the, on the, um, um, on the shackles uh, and, uh, and, and the uh, key for punishment and reward. Citizens, as far as democratic republics, citizens accept their responsibility citizens, and not primarily as consumers. Big difference between being a citizen and a consumer. Um, everyone votes. If ever, this is, again, what empowerment would look like. Everyone votes. Every vote counts. Um, elected official representatives are worthy of their offices. Uh, we have sufficient other regard uh, to be able to have some social glue, some social cohesion. Um, we are able to sufficiently compromise to move legislation into policy. Uh, we guard against creating a permanent opposition. And at least, at least, the question is always in our mind about what's the relationship and the weightiness of, of equality and liberty. Um, again, which is a concern one sees on the democracy side that I don't think one sees on the Christian nationalism side, nor on the capitalism side. Uh, so the emphasis upon including everyone, to some, you know, everyone who at least is a citizen, is is quite strong here uh, on the Democratic Republic side, and is is really fairly absent uh, on the other sides, and that should be telling, I think, for the kind of struggle we're undergoing as a nation right now. All right, so very briefly, I want you to uh, imagine that, uh, take, take kind of the kind of, this is, a, this is a trying to think about the um, validity 
uh, and sufficiency of any of these narratives, uh, any of these dramas and their sense of moral order and the like. Um, one of the things I think you're also going to find is no one story can tell it all. In other words, no one braid, uh, uh, no one strand of our braid of spirituality can be the whole thing. When it tries to become the whole thing, going back to that picture of the three plants in the soil, uh, when it tries to become the whole thing, something's going to be wrong. Um, and if one thing is, is one of those strands is too strong, it starts to strangle off the others. Um, and again, the, the outcome isn't going to be great. So think about human life cycle and key events that are shaped by maybe the spirituality of capitalism, or Christian nationalism, democracy. So once you think about, uh, you can think about any of these pieces here uh, of, of these key life events and trans life transitions and all. Um, but I'm just going to look quickly at family, elderly persons, and, and othering. Um, uh, help me see some affinities. What's the value of family for capitalism? To produce reliable workers, to produce consumers? Are rootless individuals better? Uh, which some people have said capitalism tends to push towards individualism and individual response versus heritage and loyalty and family ties and, and connections to land uh, over generations and other sorts of things. Or for Christian nationalism, uh, family uh, is very, has a very particular definition, husband-wife. It's the foundation for Christian society. For democracy, uh, family may be where the basic moral order is taught. Uh, basic, the basics that become basics of citizenship are in fact taught. Uh, what should be the role of a democratic republic, though, when families of nearly all sorts are strained by political and economic uncertainties and the majority are negatively impacted by inequalities in pay, wealth, education, housing, health care, and the like. What should be the role of democratic republic in making a more fair uh, society for family when uh, the, when the uh, over-influence, let's say, of the economy um, has threatened the structure of the family? Uh, for all, uh, what is the optimal meaning of and the shape for a family? It comes out differently. Now let's think about how the elderly are treated, how elderly persons are treated. In capitalism, the elderly are, are a primary market for health care um, and for increasing their longevity for people with money or really good insurance. Um, some with substantial wealth uh, can pursue, uh, you know, pursue things in retirement, uh, but most of us approach retirement with very limited means. Uh, and once we move into re retirement and become elderly and then actually get to the point where we could not carry on a, a livelihood anymore, physically, mentally, um, we become something of a drain uh, for this is a society that uh, I think, again, uh, values speed, risk, innovation, um, which is more and more difficult as we get older. Um, in Christian nationalism, uh, there may be some respect for age, for, the, for persons who are aged and wise, uh, some respect on the national stage, um, but not in congregations uh, where they really value young leadership, um, except for those congregations that are built on family dynasties of uh, multiple generations of the same family who are heading up the congregation. Um, in Christian nationalism, it's clear that uh, the care of all the family belongs with the family, not with the government, not with anybody else. Helped by the church, but not the government. Um, in democracy, the el and, uh, and the elderly, well, we're a large block of voters, which also means that elected officials consider this block of proposing legislation, spending money, and forming policy, um, maybe to the detriment of some other blocks. Um, are there capitalist societies that value the elderly? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how you consider Japan, for instance, where the number of elderly is persons is far exceeding the number of younger caregivers who can care for them. Um, I don't know, but that's as close as maybe I got. But it'd be an interesting question. Are there capitalist societies that value their elders? Um, what is the value of elderly persons in a culture, in a society? Um, Othering. Um, everyone and every society others others. There's us and them. There's me and not me. 
Um, and we always we're trying to negotiate that throughout our lives. For capitalism, the recognition of great human diversity can open new markets and drive innovation and customization. More diversity in the workforce means a greater need for diversity and inclusion work. Very pragmatic. Prejudice and all the isms are bad for business, which means they're um, more attractive to their customers. Um, uh, I take that back. Uh, there are the isms and prejudices which are bad for business, but there are also those businesses which engage a prejudice or an ism because they have a substantial base of customers who agree with them on that. Um, for, um, for Christian nationalism, uh, othering, well, one, we should other as God others, as the world of the holy and the profane, and the dividing line between them, uh, between Christian and non-Christian, between Christian and the wrong kind of Christian. Um, and others, those who are not on the, on the not Christian side, they tend to be assessed as enemies. For democracy, othering is certainly useful when it's in campaign season and in wooing and massaging a base of support why you should vote for me versus my opponent or opponents. Uh, scapegoating can also be useful uh, in, in creating distractions or in unifying a group. Uh, for in creating enemies, rather foreign or domestic, it is often a chance to unify people who otherwise wouldn't want anything to do with each other. Take, for instance, a revolutionary war. Um, diversity among humans is legion squared, legion squared. Um, how are we going to live with that or arrange society in order to limit uh, uh, who and what is okay and who and what is not? You could think of those same kinds of questions of using those spiritualities with any of these here and see what their adequacy and inadequacy are for addressing those issues. In the spirituality of U.S. public life, one more exercise of imagination here before we close. Imagine if leaders in the economy and religion and politics all could agree on these few things that healthy communities are fundamental for developing healthy persons. That systems are recognized and addressed as such. It's not just a matter of individual actions and state actions, that there are actually systems involved. Uh, that oftentimes, if they become sick, not oftentimes, uh, if they become sick, they need to be addressed. Systems are recognized and addressed as such. Working with differences among persons is gift an advantage, and equality is a treasured liberty. Healthy communities, systems, differences, equality. Now, what would be the elements of a public spirituality? What would be the strands of a braid that would foster these ways of being a people? Because in my opinion, if we attended to healthy communities, to the systems, to how we work the differences amongst us as gift and advantage and equality is treasured as high as liberty, we'd have something we don't have right now. All right, I want to prime the pump for this week a little bit. Uh, going back to our original question, what kinds of crops are we trying to grow in this nation? What do we need to do or stop doing in order to regenerate the soil and grow what we want to grow? And what affinities and contradictions do you see among the strands of capitalism, Christian nationalism, democratic republic? Um, I'm happy to address any of those um, and the questions you have. And as you know, uh, and some of you have done a, a, a really well in sending on to me questions that are of interest to you that we can then start our Thursday session with. Um, I look forward to being with you and talking about these spiritualities. Thanks. One more shot at the tie.